the webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call on December 1st, 2021. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals, in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2021 slash december.html. Next slide. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Describe two key points from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. Identify two new resources from CDC partners. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products suppliers of commercial services or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is One Health 2021. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by January 10th, 2022. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash One Health slash Zohu slash 2021 slash December.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by January 11th, 2024. Next slide. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Colin Basler, Deputy Director of the One Health Office, will share some news and updates. You can begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura. Hello, everyone. We appreciate you joining us for the final Zohu call webinar in 2021. Before I begin, I'd like to share some updates with you all. You can find links to these resources in today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you aren't yet subscribed, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve please check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as animals safe and healthy. Our next One Health Partners COVID-19 webinar will take place next Tuesday, December 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we've provided news, key updates, guidance, and resources for our One Health Partners. Please email onehealth at cdc.gov to receive updates and information on how to join this webinar. Next slide. 
There is no evidence that animals are playing a significant role in spreading COVID-19 to people, but we continue to see animals reported with SARS-CoV-2. In the United States, 302 animals have been reported to date, and this includes cats, dogs, ferrets, hyenas, large cats in zoos and shit sanctuaries, a binturong, a fishing cat, a kotamundi, otters, gorillas, white-tailed deer, and mink. To date, 17 mink farms have been affected by SARS-CoV-2 in the United States. The latest animal case numbers are available on the USDA APHIS website. It's for pet owners, mink farmers, veterinarians, and many others are available on CDC's website. Based on the identification of SARS-CoV-2 and white-tailed deer in multiple states, CDC recently updated our recommendations for hunters and other individuals who have regular contact with wildlife. Next slide, please. This slide shows a list of recent publications of interest, and I wanted to uh, highlight two of them. So CDC's One Health Office recently collaborated with CDC's U.S. Mexico unit to conduct an infectious disease prioritization workshop for the, southern U for the U.S. southern border region, and the report is now available online. In addition, uh, zoonotic infections is the theme for the December issue of Emerging Infectious Diseases, so be sure to check it out. Next slide, please. Uh, we've shared links to several recent announcements, including three from CDC, uh, on, including the importance of One Health for COVID-19 and future pandemics, the important updates about CDC's suspension of dogs from high-risk country for rabies, and an imported monkeypox case reported in Maryland. Next slide, please. So this slide includes some upcoming events, which include on December 14th, CDC's AMR Exchange will present a webinar entitled Hoves, Paws, or Feet, a multi-species examination of antimicrobial use and stewardship practices, and wanted to flag for everyone's announcement, uh, everyone's attention from in May 2nd to 5th of this year, we'll be, we'll, we will be holding the 71st Annual Epidemic Intelligence Service Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, there's been a new E. coli outbreak linked to baby spinach. Uh, and please visit uh, CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past US outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. We appreciate you sharing the Zohu Call website link with your colleagues from the human, animal, plant, and environmental health sectors, and letting them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continuing education. Our next call will take place on February 2nd, 2022. Please send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news from your organization to zohucall at cdc.gov. And now I'll turn it back over to Laura. Thanks. Thank you. Next slide, please. You can submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or the presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. Next slide, please. Our first presentation, SARS-CoV-2 at the Zoo, update on investigations and interventions to prevent infections in captive wildlife is by Dr. Kate Varela. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me on the call today. I appreciate the opportunity to present this work. Next slide. Zoos provide many benefits to people and animals. They deliver educational programs, support conservation, and help us learn more to protect endangered species and improve biodiversity. Next slide. Unfortunately, zoo animals haven't escaped the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and are among the different species reported with SARS-CoV-2 globally. These images show the species that have been reported so far in 30 countries. As of November 24th, public health and animal health officials have investigated 317 animal SARS-CoV-2 cases in the United States, not including mink farm outbreaks. The majority of infected animals other than mink have been household pets, mainly cats and dogs. Outside of cats, dogs, and mink, zoo animals have been a unique human-animal interface where we have seen the greatest diversity in species infected. 
On the bottom two rows of this slide, you can see jaguars, binturong, hyenas, gorillas, otters, cougars, tigers, fishing cats, lions, snow leopards, and coatis. These cases have taught us a lot about the range of species that can be infected by the virus. Next slide. Zoos have long been taking precautions to prevent COVID-19. And here you can see an example from the Detroit Zoo's website, which provides potential visitors information on COVID-19 prevention when they're making a reservation for their visit. These COVID-19 mitigation strategies vary by facility and the location, depending on the local COVID-19 ordinances. Next slide. In addition to the efforts to keep visitors safe, zoos are protecting caretakers and animals. As seen here with the caretaker wearing a face mask, even while working with a lion in an outdoor enclosure. But personal protective equipment protocols and other mitigation policies also vary by facility and may be influenced by local regulations. Next slide. Some zoos have also begun vaccinating animals using an animal specific vaccine developed by Zoetis. But again, the vaccination plans vary by facility. Next slide. And in spite of these precautions, we're still seeing cases in zoo animals, sadly with several rare and endangered species affected, and it seems like a new species every week. Next slide. This figure shows the animals that have been reported positive since the beginning of the pandemic, with the number of SARS-CoV-2 positive animals reported in the United States on the y-axis and the month reported on the x-axis since February 2020. Companion animals, zoo animals, and wildlife species are represented. It does not include the mink farm outbreaks. The first zoo cases were identified in tigers and lions at the Bronx Zoo in April 2020. Next slide. And since July of this year, we've seen an increasing trend of SARS-CoV-2 cases in zoo animals. You can see the colors start mainly pink and orange representing house cats and dogs, and then flips to greens and blues representing big cats and other zoo animals in July 2021. Next slide. As of November 24th, there have been 114 animal cases reported from 32 U.S. zoos and other captive wildlife facilities in 22 states, and this number is growing. Next slide. So federal, state, and local animal health and public health partners have conducted epidemiologic investigations of zoo animal cases to learn more about the characteristics and course of illness in these animals. An important question addressed during the investigation is whether or not the zoo animal case had a known exposure to a confirmed human case. 55% of the zoo animal cases thus far had a known exposure to a human confirmed with COVID-19. Of those with a known human exposure, it was most often a caretaker in close contact with the animal that was identified as the source of exposure. The caretaker may have been asymptomatic or symptomatic at the time of the contact. There has also been evidence of animal to animal transmission among zoological collections. For those zoo animal cases without a known exposure, the potential source may have been other staff who were not identified, a visitor, potentially an asymptomatic zoo animal, or possibly even wildlife. So far, there hasn't been evidence of transmission from infected zoo animals to people. Next slide. So with the zoo investigation still ongoing, and given that we are, there are still so many unknowns about the source of exposure, about species susceptibility to the virus, and the severity of illness in these species, we've been asking ourselves, how do we work together using a One Health approach to best protect human health and animal health? How do we ensure that we're preventing spillback of the virus from infected zoo animals to visitors, staff, and volunteers? And how do we prevent zoo animals from getting infected in the first place? Next slide. Several efforts are underway to intervene. Public health, animal health, captive wildlife facilities, and professional organizations, such as the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, are collaborating on outbreak investigations, identifying risk factors and effective interventions and best practices, conducting outreach to facilities, and we developed the COVID-19 Infection Prevention and Control Assessment Tool for captive wildlife facilities, which I will talk about in a bit more detail. Next slide. This tool is a checklist that provides a guide for baseline biosecurity measures and controls that should be in place to prevent transmission of SARS-CoV-2 
between animals and people in settings with captive wildlife, such as zoos, sanctuaries, aquaria, and wild animal rehabilitation centers. The tool was developed based on other infection prevention control assessment tools that aim to prevent the spread of infection, and specifically COVID-19, in places where people live or spend time in close proximity, otherwise known as congregate settings. It was developed using a One Health approach with input from public health, wildlife health, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and representatives from the zoos themselves. Next slide. This tool is meant to be used by the administrators in charge of infection prevention and control at the facility, which may include occupational health, human resources, veterinary staff, or facilities and maintenance. Since mitigation protocols vary by facility and geographic region, we wanted to provide a resource to help identify gaps and control measures and address those gaps with feasible improvement activities with the goal of helping facilities develop a layered approach using multiple strategies to reduce the spread of disease between people, whether they're working or visiting the facility and animals that are housed at these facilities. Next slide. So the tool is comprised of a checklist with seven specific sections seen here and resources. It's available as a fillable PDF and might be used electronically or printed. The sections can be used together, which is what we recommend, or independently if a facility has a specific area that they want to strengthen. Next slide. This is an example of the checklist, section one, general infection prevention and control. The user would read the series of yes, no questions. And for most, the preferred answer is yes, but if the answer is no, then the answer is specified. The column on the right includes suggestions and resources to improve the specific biosecurity area to help guide improvement activities for the identified gaps. So for example, for question one here, are COVID-19 symptom and temperature screening systems in place? If the answer is yes, great, move on. But if the answer is no, the user can look at the column on the right where we've included suggestions to improve this biosecurity area by implementing a screening system. And we've provided some examples. Next slide. Section one also includes questions on susceptible species management, including whether the facility has identified susceptible animals, which caretakers are working with those animals, and if the number of caretakers working with those animals is being kept to a minimum. Additionally, it asks if caretakers are working with animals in the proper sequence, going first, um, caring for susceptible animals that are healthy, and last, caring for animals with clinical signs compatible with SARS-CoV-2. And this section also includes questions about engineering controls, such as physical barriers and ventilation system checks. Next slide. Section two focuses on hand hygiene questions, such as access to hand washing stations or hand sanitizer, and if there's appropriate signage to direct people to those stations. Section three focuses on environmental cleaning and asks the person to list the products used for cleaning and disinfection in the veterinary and animal housing areas to ensure that they're EPA approved for COVID-19 and that they're being used according to the label directions. Next slide. Section four, vaccination and testing, asks about the policies for human and animal vaccination and testing protocols. Facilities may require, may consider requiring a proof of negative test result and or proof of COVID vaccination for those visitors participating in activities where they might have close contact with animals, such as behind the scenes experiences. Section five focuses on staff and vis visitor education. And it asks if employees receive training on which animals are susceptible and the disease prevention practices in place. It also asks whether visitors receive similar information. And by providing this information to both staff and visitors, we hope to improve compliance with mask use and keeping a distance from the animals and other COVID-19 mitigation protocols. Next slide. Section six focuses on personal protective equipment use and if there is a respiratory protection program in place at the facility for employees and volunteers. Respiratory protection is especially important to prevent virus transmission and facilities may consider upgrading to fit tested N95s for those employees working with or around susceptible animals. Section seven has a few additional questions on other public health control measures, such as if the facility has a process for reporting suspected animal cases, and if there's a flexible sick leave policy to encourage 
sick employees to stay home. Next slide. The tool includes resources for more information on all of the sections included in the checklist. There's a list of federal resource web pages. Next slide. And a list of professional organization resources. Next slide. So what's next? These intervention activities are still ongoing. The Association for Zoos and Aquariums is distributing the tool to members and the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership is a hosting a webinar next week for members to learn more about zoo animal infections with COVID-19, prevention measures, including the checklist, and to hear case studies from affected zoos. We'll also continue collaborating on outbreak investigations, studies to identify risk factors, and provide technical expertise as needed. Next slide. This has truly been a team effort of which I play a small role. So I'd like to sincerely thank all involved, including all the zoo staff that aren't listed here by name, but who have been cooperating during the EPI investigations and doing the boots on the ground work of implementing mitigation strategies in addition to their day-to-day -day animal care and other responsibilities. Next slide. And I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varela. Next slide. Next slide, please. Our next presentation, Inconsistent Nitrogen Dioxide Drops During COVID-19 Lockdowns, Lessons for Protecting Near-Term Public Health and Designing Longer-Term Environmental Policies, is by Dr. Susan Annenberg. Please begin when you're ready. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Susan Annenberg. I'm an associate professor at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. And I'll be talking today about how air quality changed during COVID-19 lockdowns and what that reveals in terms of environmental justice and uh, public health and longer term environmental policies. I want to start by thanking several of the major contributors to this work. Uh, most especially Dr. Dan Goldberg and Dr. Gage Kerr from George Washington University. Next slide, please. So I would just want to start by talking about why study nitrogen dioxide, or NO2. You may have heard of NO2. It's one of the six criteria air pollutants regulated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And it's a tracer for urban traffic. It's a combustion-related air pollution that is released anytime we're combusting fuel. In urban areas, it really is a major tracer for traffic-related air pollution. And that means that when we study NO2, it helps us to understand transportation emissions and what that means for uh, public health and how we might design environmental policy to reduce the public health consequences of traffic-related air pollution. NOx emissions, which is a precursor to NO2, so NOx emissions, nitrogen oxides, are precursors to fine particulate matter, or PM2.5, and ozone, which are two additional criteria air pollutants and actually the dominant uh, contributors to the burden of disease from air pollution in the United States and around the world. So in order to reduce PM2.5 and ozone, we must reduce NOx emissions as well as other air pollutant emissions. Nitrogen dioxide itself is associated with asthma development among children. That is not just asthma exacerbation, although NO2 is also associated with asthma emergency department visits and hospital admissions. But NO2 is associated with new development of asthma among children. And so it is a pollutant of concern, uh, particularly for pediatric health. In recent years, we have major advances in space-based air quality observations, that is satellites that are orbiting the Earth and taking snapshots of air quality between the Earth's surface and the satellite. We can actually use space-based NO2 columns, that is the amount of NO2 between the surface of the Earth and the satellite. We can actually use these, use these space-based NO2 columns to understand what people on the ground are actually exposed to because these NO2 columns are very highly correlated with ground level concentration. And so here we just have a map of uh, New York at the top and Washington DC at the bottom and our best estimate of NO2 concentrations um, in both of these cities. And you can see you know, the uh, high, very high concentration, concentrations in the densely populated downtown areas, 
uh, but also surrounding all uh, roadways. Next slide, please. We have estimated the percent of pediatric asthma incidents, that's again, new cases of asthma among children that can be attributed to NO2 pollution in thousands of cities worldwide. I'm just showing uh, here the top 125 cities, the most populated 125 cities. And what we can see here is that the fraction of new pediatric asthma cases that are estimated to be attributable to NO2 pollution ranges all the way up to 48%, and that's in Shanghai. So what that indicates is that nearly half of new pediatric asthma cases in Shanghai could be attributable to traffic-related air pollution. Now, that fraction is not small for other parts of the world, which we may think of as having much better air quality than Shanghai. So I want to draw your attention to the top right, sorry, the top left uh, panel here where it says high income. Um, if you start on the left and you start to uh, go over, you'll see Los Angeles and New York City. And in these, in these cities, about 33% of new pediatric asthma cases are uh, attributable to NO2 pollution. In Washington, D.C., where I live and where I have three kids who are growing up and developing lungs, um, it's about a quarter. So a quarter of new pediatric asthma cases in Washington, D.C. can be attributable, attributable to traffic-related air pollution. Next slide, please. Now, uh, back in uh, February and March 2020, my colleague, Dr. Dan Goldberg, was just pouring through satellite images and trying to understand how urban concentrations of nitrogen dioxide differed uh, between cities across the United States and around the world. And he created a map that uh, looked like this uh, shortly after COVID began and lockdown started and people stopped uh, driving as much. We saw about a 50% drop in passenger vehicle traffic across much of the United States. Um, and so actually we were perfectly set up at, in the early stages of the lockdown to leverage the unprecedented amount of information about air quality that we have from the new generation of satellites and link that together with the unprecedented change in human activity that we were experiencing during this natural experiment of COVID-19 lockdown. And so he created this map where uh, anywhere where you see blue is where NO2 concentrations in 2020 were lower than they were in 2019. And we can see much lower NO2 concentrations in much of the major cities across the United States, including Los Angeles, and Chicago, and San Francisco, and uh, New York, Washington. And we wanted to understand you know, at around the same time as the lockdowns were happening, we were experiencing a seasonal change. We were going from winter to spring. Um, and at the same time, much of the United States was actually experiencing very wet and windy weather. I don't know if you, if you recall, um, but much of the East Coast and actually Los Angeles were experiencing very wet and windy weather that was actually keeping pollution levels low, regardless of the anthropogenic emission changes. So we wanted to know how large would these NO2 drops be if we normalized out the, meteorologi the meteorological effect? And what does this reveal about environmental justice issues related to air quality? We know from many other studies that air pollution continues to be inequitably distributed across the United States and within our cities. And this is really an unprecedented natural experiment that allows us a window to explore that. And we wanted to know how did varying degrees of urban transportation changes during the lockdowns cause these NO2 decreases? Next slide, please. So uh, Dan Goldberg created several methods for trying to disentangle the anthropogenic emission changes that we were experiencing based on people staying home during lockdowns from the seasonal and meteorological effects, those natural effects that were keeping pollution low around the same time that the lockdowns began. Um, and I won't go through this in detail, so I just want to point you to the uh, portion of the slide at the right that's boxed in red. This is the 20 city average, the average across 20 North American cities, uh, where the y-axis is the percent change in column NO2 observed from the satellite. Now, when we just compare 2020, um, the, the lockdown period versus the earlier part of 2020 in January and February, we saw about a 40% drop in NO2 on average across these 20 cities. And we saw those results being, uh, being communicated by journalists um, where there were stories coming out about how clear the Los Angeles skyline were, 
was and um, how the air was much better to breathe in Washington, D.C. Um, but again, that doesn't tell us what portion of that NO2 drop was due to those natural changes versus anthropogenic emission changes. And so Dan came up with several different methods to disentangle that, and they all came out around the same on average for these 20 cities that about half of the NO2 drop that was experienced on average across these 20 cities was due to the meteorological change, and about half was due to the anthropogenic changes. And so the anthropogenic, the anthropogenic changes were responsible for about a 20% uh, drop in column NO2 amounts during the lockdown period. Next slide, please. Dr. Gage Kerr, who's a research scientist at George Washington University, um, was being hired around the same time. We were quite lucky for him to join our team and start to dig into census tract level NO2 concentrations and compare that with demographics to understand what the natural experiment of COVID-19 lockdowns revealed about environmental injustice. And so there's a lot going on in this slide. It was published in uh, PNAS. In earlier this year, and uh, the, you can see the paper on the right-hand side here if you want to learn more. But I just want to step you through the top uh, row here where it says all. That is all census tracts across the United States. And we're looking at NO2 column amounts as observed by the TROPOMI satellite sensor. And we see that uh, when we compare the in the baseline period that is prior to COVID-19 uh, with the solid connector lines, we see that the NO2 concentrations in the least white census tracts across the United States, depicted with the orange dot, are, almost, are more than double the NO2 concentrations in the most white census tracts shown in the blue dots. And so that's, you know, again, not surprising. We know that these inequities exist in NO2 concentrations between the least white census tracts and the most white census tracts. But we wanted to understand what happened to those disparities during the COVID-19 lockdowns. And we see that with the dashed connector line. Um, and so what we saw was that both the orange dots and the blue dots shifted to the left. And what that indicates is that satellite NO2 columns uh, re were lower uh, during the lockdown compared with the baseline period. And they actually dropped more for the least white census tracts compared to the most white census tracts. So that's, you know, maybe a good news story, but uh, it's actually more complicated than that because what we found is that the NO2 concentrations in the least white census tracts during the lockdown still exceeded the NO2 concentrations in the most white census tracts prior to the lockdowns. And we see that in the orange dot connected to the dashed connector line um, being shifted to the right compared with the blue dot connected to the solid connector line. So what this indicates is that these, the disparities in NO2 concentrations prior to the lockdowns was so large that even about a 50% drop in passenger vehicle traffic during the lockdowns was not enough to erase those disparities. And we see this pattern persist across um, all of the major cities in the United States, and it also holds for income and educational attainment. Next slide, please. Now, we're looking into this a little bit further to try to understand what are the drivers of these NO2 drops and the different sizes of NO2 drops that we saw even after we uh, disentangled the natural influences from the anthropogenic emission changes. And it turns out a really nice place to look at this is in Europe, where um, the different countries of Europe have very different percentages of diesel in their passenger vehicle market. Um, here in the United States, almost all of our passenger vehicles are powered by gasoline. Um, but in Europe, it can range from just a few percent uh, of the gasoline can range from about a few percent uh, market share of the passenger vehicle segment to more than 50 percent. And it turns out that the higher the market share of diesel passenger vehicles, the greater the change in NO2, the greater the drop in NO2 during the COVID-19 lockdowns. So what this tells us is that um, the uh, diesel vehicles are much more polluting than gasoline vehicles. Um, and if we were to eliminate diesel from the passenger vehicle market, we would achieve um, drops in NO2 that would be health beneficial. Next slide, please. We are digging into this further because I think what the COVID-19 natural experiment highlighted for us anyway was that the passenger vehicle segment, which was the sector that was most influenced by COVID-19 lockdowns, uh, because the 50% drop in passenger vehicles did not erase those disparities, there is something else that is also contributing to those persistent disparities in NO2 pollution across the United States. 
Um, we actually compared uh, in the locations of industrial plants, of electricity generating units, of airports, um, and what we found is that the it, it really is the heavy duty trucking and busing segment that seems to be contributing most consistently across the United States. Um, and so we're now digging into trucking and buses uh, a little bit more, and you can see how we can actually observe this from space. This really floors me every time I look at these images. Um, but this is just two images of the DC area. On the left-hand side here, we can see high NO2 concentration picked up by the satellite around this warehousing area just north of uh, Dulles, and that's because of the trucking activity going into and out of this warehousing uh, area. And on the right-hand side here, we can see higher NO2 levels along Interstate 95. Uh, which allows trucks compared to the Baltimore-Washington Parkway, which prohibits trucks. So we'll be digging into this a little bit more and taking a look at the influence of heavy-duty trucking across the United States more consistently. Next slide, please. So just to conclude that satellite-derived NO2 concentrations are quite valuable for understanding the inequitable distribution of air pollutants and their health impacts. And there's several different reasons for that. We tend to focus on PM2.5, which is the dominant contributor to the overall burden of disease from air pollution. But in, in contrast with PM2.5, NO2 has a much shorter atmospheric lifetime, less influence from regional pollution sources, and very sharp gradients near emission sources. In addition, we have the convenient fact that satellite NO2 column observations are tightly correlated with NO2 observed at ground monitors. And this provides an observational record of spatial patterns in urban combustion-related air pollution. It's really a new avenue for tracking air pollution injustice that was never before possible. We have a new satellite instrument called TEMPO that is being launched by NASA next year and that will further increase the environmental justice relevant satellite record for NO2. Um, if you'd like more information about this, we wrote a very accessible uh, paper called Leveraging Satellite Data to Address Air Pollution Inequities. Um, and with that, I will conclude and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, thank you for advancing the slide. Our final presentation, building a comprehensive approach in CDC's National Center for Environmental Health to address the health effects of climate change is by Dr. Eric R. Spenson. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, the impacts of climate change are around and apparent each and every day. Uh, this is just a graphic which helps us to be able to see the connections between, between our changing climate and human health. So if we look at the center of the circle, uh, we can see that uh, the climate uh, is changing uh, through rising temperatures, more extreme weather, and rising sea levels, and th these impact further environmental changes around it. And then lastly, this impacts human health, as you can see on the exterior of this image. So human health Im impacts can range from direct injuries and storms to vector-borne diseases and even respiratory diseases such as asthma, which we just heard about. Next slide, please. So if you look at uh, the climate and health program that we currently have uh, at CDC, we have uh, been put together uh, since, two, uh, since 2009 to look at how we can help support public health programs across the country uh, through providing different types of funding and guidance from our uh, subject matter experts uh, divide, to develop and provide decision support tools to them as well to help look at the issues in their jurisdictions and to help foster partnerships between public health and other sectors. So you see here, uh, this is the core of what we have at CDC in our climate and health program, which was started a little more than 10 years ago. But as you saw in that image earlier, next slide, sorry. Uh, the impacts of climate uh, really are much bigger than uh, just one disease or another. And it implies that there really is much 
going on across the entire spectrum of public health that needs to be looked at. So while we in, in uh, the National Center for Environmental Health are focused on these core public health programs, and we're the only program that's currently funded to address climate change, there's relevant work going on across the entire agency and has been for many, many years uh, that is related to this climate and health uh, broader spectrum of efforts. So we created a cross-agency task force uh, back in March of this year to start looking at how we can coordinate our work across CDC uh, better and to uh, have a more strategic approach to addressing climate change as an entire agency. So this task force has now grown to have over 140 members from across the entire agency and includes five different subcommittees which have been working together since March to address these issues and develop our CDC climate and health strategy. So we are working to integrate all of these different activities uh, from across the different sectors uh, and different parts of the agency. And these range from uh, the research to surveillance policy and partnerships, as you see in the slide. Next slide, please. So our climate and health strategy has been pulled together and we've, we have a first draft, which we will be uh, releasing uh, hopefully by the end of this month. And you see the mission and vision statements, which we pulled together here on the slide. A full strategy uh, will continue to be up, uh, updated in, and provided here in the near future uh, as we continue to look at the changing priorities that are happening around us. So the next slide, please. So now going back to our core program, uh, the program within the National Center for Environmental Health, which has been funded for the last several years. So we also took the effort uh, after we saw that climate change and health was a significant priority within the new administration, we looked at how we could build it up across our entire division and our entire center. And so we as an organization, we, we have typically been working with our local jurisdictions, state, territorial, tribal, public health jurisdictions through the strategy uh, that we call the BRACE framework, the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects framework. So this framework has been quite successful and impactful across the country. And the, the uh, image to the right shows the different steps that we use to help uh, local jurisdictions to prepare for and adapt to the changing climate around them and protecting public health through it. So beyond that, we wanted to look at seeing what else can we do within uh, environmental health to be able to address this comprehensive uh, challenge that we have to us in public health. And so we started our own internal strategic planning back in uh, early 2020, and then that completed uh, earlier in the year this year before we started the entire CDC-wide initiative. And so where we landed was we really needed to focus on three different areas in how we are going to be expanding out our program. And that those three areas are data, science, and action. And within that, uh, as was recognized in the new administration, but implicit within the work that we had been doing for years, uh, we really needed to weave in environmental justice and health equity, but not just weave it in like we normally have, but to advance it, elevate it, and to prioritize it uh, as it needs to be, as you just heard from Dr. Annenberg as well. It's a massive issue in many different areas of environmental health. And then we look at all the different levers that we can use to advance this work, whether it be policy, communications, or evaluation. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna show you three examples of uh, these as in the next few slides. The first one is a data example. So the CDC's heat and health tracker, which is shown here, is a collaboration between the climate and health program 
in the National Center for Environmental Health and the National Environmental Public Health Tracking Program also within the National Center for Environmental Health. So this online platform is intended to help health departments and jurisdictions prepare for extreme heat events, like the unprecedented heat events that we saw this past summer in the Pacific Northwest. So this includes syndromic surveillance data on heat-related hospitalizations, a monthly heat forecast that CDC has developed with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, county-level social vulnerability index indicator data, and resources that can be used to plan for and respond to heat waves. Next slide, please. Another example is a science example. So the CDC's National Center for Emerging Zoonotic Infectious Diseases is studying the impact of temperature and precipitation on the expansion of different tick species and the potential impact on vector-borne disease. So using a One Health approach, this research involves cross-agency collaboration, including collaboration with our program, and is helping to inform the National Vector-Borne Disease Strategy. Next slide, please. All right, and then lastly, the last example is an action example. So uh, CDC funds cities, tribes, territories to prepare for and respond to health impacts of climate change. This is through what we call the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative and the Climate Ready Tribes and Territories Initiative. So all of the current and formally funded jurisdictions, jurisdictions can't talk today. Jurisdictions are shown here. So 11 new cooperative agreements were awarded just recently in October of this year, and those are shown in blue. Of course, like any program, we would love to expand the work that we do to the entire nation. We would love to see if we can have more and more climate-ready cities and states across the nation. So that is our dream, but we're not there yet. So, but this is our last example and an action example of how we're taking our science and taking our data and putting it out into the field to help protect the public's health. All right, with that, I think we can go ahead and move on to questions as a whole. So thank you very much. Next thank slide. Next slide, yeah. And one more, thank you. Thanks to all of today's speakers for your informative presentations. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2021 slash December dot html. We do have time for some questions. As a reminder, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions and please include the presenter's name or topic. So our first question is for Dr. Varela. Um, this person is curious about how the exposures occurred in the zoo animal cases. Um, were zoos on lockdown during any time during COVID in the U.S.? And was this transmission more zoo um, staff to zoo animals or from visitors? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so at this time, we, like you said, 55% of the cases have been associated with an infected caretaker. and. Um, some of the activities that the caretakers were engaged in would be something like feeding, administering medications, things that brought the animals into close contact with the, the caretaker. Um, so far, we have not been able to identify any um, associations between visitors and infections in, in animals in these zoos, but investigations are still ongoing. Um, might be a little bit difficult to, to be able to get that information. Um, so people, you know, if people come and go um, and we don't have, you know, testing protocols for visitors in place of these facilities. And to answer your second question, yes, um, many zoos were locked down during uh, most of the pandemic and, you know, just started reopening when things started to get a little bit better last summer. Um, and, you know, they've been many different zoos, many zoos have been impl implementing many different types of mitigation strategies. Um, and so I don't know if we're more to that question. 
I hope I answered all of that. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question um, is again for Dr. Varela. Do you know what the fatality of rate of SARS-CoV-2 has been um, in wild animals, if there is a fatality rate? Yeah, so many of the zoo animals that are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 are endangered species, and some have become seriously ill as a result of infection. Luckily, the vast majority of all animals that became infected um, have only mild clinical signs and have made a full recovery. There have been rare reports of zoo animals infected with SARS-CoV-2 that have died, but investigations are ongoing, and the cause of death and the contribution of SARS-CoV-2 is still being determined. Um, we've actually developed a standard investigation protocol for deceased animals that were positive for SARS-CoV-2 that was tested in companion animals, and the same approach is being used to learn more about zoo animals. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Svensson. Um, are there actions that any cities are taking to counter the effects of climate change with CDC support? Um, and if so, could you provide an example? Oh yes, there are many uh, different uh, interventions which are happening all throughout the, the nation. And the interventions that are being uh, put into place in the different cities and, and jurisdictions across the country are, are dependent on the risks that they face in their local areas. I'll just give you one simple example uh, that would be somewhat implicit for some of you. So the city of Phoenix is hot as it is. It's always been a hot city, but it's been getting hotter like a lot of our cities. And so through uh, the work that we've been uh, helping to support, they've been able to help expand our cooling centers across the city so that homeless people and people who are at risk don't have access to sufficient cooling at their home uh, are able to come in and cool off uh, in a safe and secure area to help protect the impacts of heat on uh, the public there. So that's one example, and there are many more, <laughs> but I will, uh, given the time, I will leave it at that for now. Thank you. Um, another question for Dr. Varela, uh, are mandating masks at the zoo for caretakers, is that to, pro uh, to help protect the animals? Or what is the purpose of that? Thank you. Yeah, so yes, we know that using masks helps to, um, you know, it's a source control. So it is being used to help prevent any infection that could be transmitted between the caretakers and the animals. So for those um, facilities that are, are recommending or mandating them for their caretakers, yes. Yeah, the way to protect the animals um, and also the people, you know, from spreading the virus between each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and a question for Dr. Annenberg. What was the most surprising change in satellite observed in NO2 during the pandemic? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think, uh, to be quite honest, the most surprising observed effect that we saw was the disparities. And that's not because I was surprised that there are disparities. I was just really surprised that space-based instruments are capable of picking up those disparities. It's just still really incredible to me that we have these things traveling around the planet and they can see street level air pollution and how pollution differs at the neighborhood scale. Um, so that's, uh, that has led to us forming a NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Team or HACAS Tiger Team satellite data for environmental justice and trying to figure out how we can link these satellite data to uh, EJ environmental justice mapping tools and help track and address these, these inequities. Thank you. We have another question for Dr. Varela. Are there case control studies being conducted for risk factors in zoo animals and COVID-19 cases? Yeah, so there are, um, a few different projects going on right now that are surveys to look at the different practices um, at, at several different zoos. Um, not necessarily a case control study, um, as far as I know, but 
I do think that would be very valuable um, if we were to do that. So, um, so hopefully there'll be more research coming out in the future. Thank you. And then another question for Dr. Stenson, is the climate change interagency group organized under the White House's Global Change Research Program? Well, I'll try to explain that briefly, given we don't have a lot of time, but uh, we're a federal agency and uh, we work under a structured um, kind of approach under health and human services. And so our initial program that we've had at CDC is within the National Center for Environmental Health. It's been funded for the last uh, 12 years. Now we're looking at expanding it across the entire agency. So developing a CDC wide plan and eventually with the hopes of having broader CDC funding across uh, the entire scope of the plan so that we can have a CDC wide initiative. So that is uh, being coordinated under uh, Health and Human Services. There's a new uh, office, uh, what I call it, Office of Climate and Health and Health Equity. Um, I guess they call it OCHI. And so it's up at the um, off HHS office. And so those are the ones who are primarily working above us in the uh, interagency types of uh, collaboratives that was mentioned there, the representatives of our program which are up at HHS. I hope that helped. Yes, thank you. If you have other questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. A video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide, please. Please join us for the next Zohu call on February 2nd, 2022. Um, a reminder that we do not have a call in January. And thank you for your participation. This ends today's webinar.